Okay, we are back and we have been chatting about Frida Kahlo and women in art. And since I'm not an art historian, I don't really want to say too much on tape or for posterity um, about women, women artists. Uh, but I think it is interesting to think about people like Frida Kahlo and what their connection is or was to the art scene of a certain time and place and why it is at certain times we do get interested in people like Frida Kahlo. Uh, what I do want to do in this part of class today is to talk about gender and get back to the whole topic of indigenous women and indigenous women's roles, their role in history. Uh, I want to particularly focus on the history of indigenous or native women in the 20th century. Um, but like Frida Kahlo, there is a particular indigenous women whose name, woman whose name is very well known, uh, who I will mention briefly later. Uh, her name is Rigoberta Menchu. And I am interested in this whole issue of, in relationship to women's history and gender roles, I am interested in this whole question of iconic women, who they are and why they become iconic. Why do they become such important symbols carrying all sorts of weight? So when we talk about women in the colonial period, Everybody starts with Malinsin, whom we talked about earlier in the semester. When we talk about women artists, everybody talks about Frida Kahlo. When we talk about indigenous women, especially women as activists, and that's a whole subject that I will get to today, everybody talks about Rigoberta Menchu. And these women are iconic. They are in and of themselves very important. But I, w I will argue about each of the women that I've just mentioned um, that in part they're important because their own lives were, were deeply fascinating for all sorts of public and private reasons. But also they're iconic because they are symbolic of larger shifts and changes. Sometimes they bring those changes about themselves. Sometimes social or historical changes make them more important and then we recognize their importance. But in focusing on those particular women, and Frida Kahlo helps us think about Professor Kuntz's very, very insightful lecture about visual culture, that gets us back to the whole theme of culture, which has been important in the second part of our course, that is, in the, in the second part of the semester. And the concept of culture has been used in a whole variety of ways by Professor Zimmerman talking about cultural studies, by Professor Chestnut talking about religion and culture, by Professor Hernandez talking about culture and stories, the stories that people tell themselves and others about their cultures and history um, in order to understand their own identity. Art can also be seen both as a kind of culture and as part a part of a larger culture as Professor Kuntz talked about. And gender roles obviously are also a very important part of culture and history. And that's the topic that I want to pick up with. I had started to talk about indigenous women and their history, I think about two weeks ago. Uh, but I had not been able to fully talk about the topic. And I really do have a lot more to say about it. And that's what I would like to what I would like to talk about during my part of class today. And I want to I want for us to be thinking about native women in the 20th and 21st centuries. 
I had mentioned a number of themes as I began to talk about that. So let me get back to this issue of themes and issues that I think are important in terms of understanding women's history and women's roles. I think there are a number of points that are important to recognize. One has to do with the ways that indigenous women filled institutionalized economic and political roles in order to carry out tasks of production and reproduction. These roles can carry authority, they have in the past, they do in the present, and they can also express women's agency. Remember we talked about this concept of agency, how people act in the world, how they act in order to ensure their own survival on a daily basis, and sometimes how they act more dramatically to create change. Resistance, rebellion, revolution, these have also been themes that we've talked about this semester, and women have played a role in those kinds of activities. And that's something else that I think is important to, to chronicle in terms of women's, women's history. And what's been interesting about indigenous women is that in many times and places, they have been active in political and social conflicts and in activities of resistance, and they have done so they have been active agents, even though gender dynamics, kinship and household structures, and patterns of land ownership often have acted to limit women's range of action within indigenous communities. And that's been another whole important issue for women to deal with in the past and in the present. That is that the patriarchal political structure of nation states which I think is a carryover from both colonial political and legal structures as well as the liberal nation building agenda of the 19th century in Latin America. Um, but these patriarchal political structures reinforced by certain kinds of political and economic changes of the 20th century also reinforce gender roles and dynamics in indigenous communities. And so that's been something that that's been something that women have had to deal with. Um, in the research that I've done on the history of indigenous women, which is one of the areas that I've concentrated on in terms of my own research while I've been at the university, in my, re in my research I've examined gender roles and women's lives in many different groups across Latin America. And I'll quickly go through a list of groups that I've worked on and that I will talk about today in surveying indigenous women's histories, hi history and roles. First, I've looked at indigenous women in different parts of Mesoamerica and I will talk about Nahua women, Nahua women being the descendants of the Aztecs. I'm going to talk about women among the Zapotecs uh, the Zapotecs, as I'll mention, are found in the contemporary state of Oaxaca in, in Mexico. And the Zapotecs often refer to themselves, referred to themselves, especially in the past, as uh, the Nudzawi. But the term Zapotec is often commonly used and is commonly used today. I'll also talk about women among the Maya. Rigoberta Menchu, whom I have briefly mentioned, is a Maya woman from Guatemala, and she has had an interesting and important life. I'll just mention now that she was the 1992, and the year 1992 is very important in this context. She was the 1992 Nobel Peace Prize winner. And if you think about why the year 1992 might be important in relation to Roberta Menchu, remember that 1992 was the quincentennial or 500th year quote unquote anniversary because not everybody saw it as a celebration, but 1992 was the 500th year anniversary of Columbus coming to the New World. So 1992 had lots of, that was a year with lots of significance. I've also looked at 
the history of indigenous women in South America. And here it's important to draw a distinction, as I will, between Highland South America in the western part of South America, the highlands running along the western side of the Andes Mountains, from the western side of the Andes Mountains to the western coast. And there are a number of groups that I've looked at there, and I'll get into that in more detail. Then I've looked at women of the tropical lowlands, and I'll talk about that. And women of the tropical lowlands span in their culture span a number of countries and regions, and their cultures are quite different from the highland cultures of South America. Then there are indigenous women of Central America, and we had been talking two classes ago about Central America. Here I will talk in particular about three groups and gender roles among those three groups, the Garifunas, the Mosquitoes, and the Kunas. And if I'm lucky enough to get through all that today, then I will come back again to the question of what commonalities, what common themes can we draw about and conclusions can we draw about women's roles across these very broad areas, which geographically and culturally are very, very different. And I'll also try to spend a little bit of time talking about the future. Given a fairly detailed understanding of women's roles in 20th century Native cultures, what does that understanding, what might that understanding allow us to predict about Native women's roles in the future? And before I get in, into some of the specifics and begin to look at specific groups, I do want to talk about, briefly, about this term indigenous. In Latin America, Native people are often referred to of course, as Indios or Indians, but in Latin America, the term Indio often has a very, ne a very negative connotation in a very racially and ethnically stratified world. The term Indio is often used by non-Indians non or non-Indios uh, to, to use a, a sort of hybrid term. It's often used by non-Indios in a way that is not, it's, it's not neutral. It carries very negative implications, not just about poverty, but about the, cul the negative cultural characteristics of groups, what we would what we in North America might refer to as Indian groups or Indian tribes. The term can be used in a very negative or pejorative way about both people and groups. And therefore, in my own writing, I, I tend to stay away from it. And I, I tend to use the words either native or indigenous, um, indigenous being a word that is often used in Latin America, though many times when quote unquote indigenous people refer to themselves, they often refer to themselves by terms that refer to the name of their community, occasionally the name of the ethnicity, though that depends on the area, because it's only very, very recently, for example, that the Maya have a sense of themselves as Mayas per se. And I could talk at much greater length about the history and nature of ethnicity, but I don't, I don't really want to take up a whole lot of time, a whole lot of time about that now. But I guess what I'd like to emphasize is, is this idea that 
the term Indian or Indio is not a positive one, therefore it, I've tended to stay away from it. And actually, I, I kind of like the term that's used in Canada, which is first, the term first peoples or first people is usually used in Canada to refer to what we might call Native Americans or indigenous people. I like that term. I think it's actually, in a lot of ways, the most accurate term, but it's not used in Latin America, so, so I won't impose it. Um, as I talk about groups of groups of people today. Also, I, I do just want to point out that I think it is important to be conscious of how people think about themselves. How do they name themselves? Because that helps us understand something about how they understand themselves. But also, I think, as outsiders to their communities or ethnicities, it's very important that we ask them, well, what do you want to be called? because when we're talking to them or reading about them or learning about them, I do think we need to remember that their culture doesn't exist simply for us to consume as something interesting, but it exists because they live it every day. And we need to remember that and be respectful of it. Coming back to the issue of indigenous women, which is what I really want to focus on today, I am going to look at this by region and I've, I've given you uh, a little bit of a sense of the regions. And I do want to start with Nahua women. Um, Nahua women are the descendants of the group that you would know as the Aztecs. They live in central Mexico. They are spread, Nahuas are spread over a very large area of central Mexico today. And these are the people that in my own work I know the most about. And so I'll talk about Nahua women at the greatest length and then use some of the ideas, issues, and concepts that I've already mentioned and that I will use as I talk about Nahua women. Uh, I will use some of these ideas and concepts as a, a way to, to talk about the other groups that I've mentioned. So Nahua women are the descendants of the group, as I've just said, that you would know as the Aztecs. Nahuas are spread over a very large part of central Mexico from the northern state of San Luis Potosí in the northeastern part of the nation of Mexico. Nahuas are also found in the central states of Hidalgo, the state of Mexico, as opposed to the city of Mexico or the Distrito Federal. They are also found in the state of Puebla, the state of Tlaxcala, and then to the west in the states of Guerrero and Morelos, as well as Veracruz to the south and east. So Nahua people or Nahuatl speaking peoples and not all the communities that might be classified as Nahua today have many people left in them still speaking, still speaking Nahuatl. That's a whole other question. Um, but Nahuatl communities span a very large area. And because of that, it's no surprise, I think, that local communities, local economies, and women's roles within these communities and economies do vary. Nonetheless, anthropologists, when they wrote about Nahuatl peoples in the 20th century, when anthropologists, ethnographers, and actually ethnography is another term I should put up here as a concept that's been mentioned. And ethnography is an intensive study of a particular group at a particular point in time. I write history, so I tend to look at groups and people over time. Professor Hernandez writes anthropological ethnography, so she looks at groups, people, and places at a particular point in time. And her research is all based on her interaction with those people. Some of mine is, but most of mine is based on reading documents, and, and that's, that's a difference. One of the things I did in trying to look at the history of women is use ethnographies as historical documents. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. 
When ethnographers of the Nawas wrote about women in the 20th century, they often wrote about them as if they didn't do anything more than live in their houses and essentially they were the Nawa version of 1950s housewives. And a very well-known ethnographer of Mexico, Robert Redfield, in 1930 captured this idea very nicely when he wrote, and here I quote, while he, Nawa male, is led by the cycle of the sun, she, the female, is the servant of another cycle, that of hunger and its satisfaction. And I think that's a very nice way of talking about being a housewife. And it's especially talking about being a housewife who is really concerned about food and cooking. Other ethnographers from Oscar Lewis on, who wrote in the 1950s and 60s and wrote a very important important series of ethnographies about both Nawas and then about working class people in Mexico City. Other ethnographers from Oscar Lewis on found that Nawa women's work has not only been household based during the 20th century, but that it has also varied regionally and changed over time. So what kinds of work have women done besides the work that they've done in the home? They have worked as domestic servants. They have worked at selling in local or regional markets, meaning outdoor markets. They've done storekeeping in small shops. They've worked in textile factories. We think of Maquilas as a late 20th century development on the Mexican-U.S. border. But in fact, factories to produce cloth and or assemble textiles of various sorts have existed in Latin America from the 19th century on. And some of those factories were put in rural areas, not in urban areas. And Nawa women were among the first textile workers in textile factories in Tlaxcala, in the state of Tlaxcala in Mexico, in the 19th century. Women also, Nawa women have also provided paid labor for agriculture. They've also worked in health-related tasks such as being midwives curers, and performing as ritual specialists. Economic change across Mexico and in many parts of the central region has had an impact on women's labor. The introduction of textile factories in the 19th century. In some places, those factories employed women, as I mentioned. In some places, those factories tended more to employ men. But what that then did is it left women to take up the slack in terms of work in communities and homes. And so there were all sorts of ways in which modernizing economic change, because we, we just finished hearing about modernism as a trend in art, but modernization is also an important trend in political and economic history. Modernization, the coming of factories, for example, no matter whether factories employed men or women, that employment had implications for the other gender. Another economic change of significance for Nahua women dates to the 1920s when commercial corn mills were established. And com commercial corn mills were very important because commercial corn, commercial corn mills meant that individual women no longer had to spend time every day grinding corn for tortillas. Oscar Lewis, who I already mentioned, another very important ethnographer, 
wrote about the importance of corn mills, and I will quote, The mills have been great time savers. Previously, women spent from four to six hours a day grinding corn, often getting up at four in the morning to prepare tortillas for their husbands. Now women get more sleep, usually rising at six. The time saved is used in various ways, such as sewing, knitting, going to church more often, and doing household chores. The added leisure has in many cases been turned towards gainful pursuits, such as raising chickens, pigs, and cows. Furthermore, many women became merchants on a small scale and regularly go to, regularly go to Cuernavaca or other cities to sell corn, bean, eggs, etc. The improved communication offered by the road and bus lines made this possible. Men assert that there has been an increase in adultery because of the fact that so many young married women go to Cuernavaca or other cities alone. Indeed, the husbands of these women are called tonto or fools for permitting their wives such liberties. There are a number of interesting aspects of that passage from Oscar Lewis's writing in terms of some of the assumptions he makes, but in terms of some of the observation, observations he makes about gender roles embedded just in this brief passage about the impact of corn mills. More recent changes have also had a great impact. On the Gulf Coast, for example, where oil was found and where cattle economies, that is ranching economies, have become more important in the second half of the 20th century, a whole series of changes have taken place. These include land loss, in some cases out-migration, as land has moved from communities to large landed estates, And increasing amounts of capital, whatever capital comes to exist in indigenous communities, has increasingly been concentrated in male hands. And that has tended to undermine Nahua women's access in this region. It's undermined their access to and control of land and wages. These patterns cause women to become more dependent on men for their economic survival. And the issue of access to land has also undermined the, eco the economic well-being of women. In most Nahua regions, sons traditionally inherited more property than daughters. But on the Gulf Coast, the spread of larger-scale cattle ranching has undermined many men's and women's, especially women's, access to land. So what you have happening in Nahua communities is the emergence of a more rigid class structure, greater differentiation among families in terms of their access to wealth and where greater amounts of wealth have come into these communities, men have tended to control it. And that, of course, has lots of implications. In terms of politics and Nahua women's political activities, it is important to examine the context in which women can hold power, starting with the family and household. While the nuclear family is the most common residential and economic unit, the three-generation unit of grandparents, married children, and their children remains an important social unit even today. Patrilocal marriage, which is a marriage pattern in which a young bride moves in with or near her husband's family and provides labor for the family under the direction typically of her mother-in-law, helps reinforce this structure. This marriage pattern means that young brides typically endure a difficult period of adjustment during which they hold a position of extreme submission to their husbands, to their fathers-in-law, and to their mothers-in-law. By all reports, it's not fun. Age, however, brings changes in women's status in the household. A general pattern of female submissiveness does not preclude high levels of conflict between spouses. As Oscar Lewis noted in, 19, in 1951, quote, according to the ideal culture patterns for husband-wife relations in the community he, he was studying, which was named Tepoztlan, the husband is an authoritarian patriarchal figure who is head and master of the household and enjoys the highest status in the family. But Lewis also observed that the dominant husband-submissive wife pair is, to some extent, a quote-unquote social fiction. While the new wife faces a difficult period of adjustment 
because she's left the security of her own home and needs to please demanding in-laws and a demanding husband, she will most likely someday herself become a mother-in-law as she moves through the life cycle, one who enjoys authority over her children, daughters-in-law, sometimes even over her own husband. Recent ethnography suggests also that the pattern of marriage is changing. Patrilocal marriage certainly still exists, but married children are forming their own household sooner, which is then removing a younger married couple from that um, context of authority more quickly. And some women are making their own choices to separate from their husbands and to either live with their Fam their own families of, of birth, or to live on their own, or not to marry at all, yet to still have children. But I should also point out that apart from the kinds of authority that a woman can almost naturally grow into through the course of the life cycle, Nama women also take on more publicly recognized authority roles. These include roles such as midwives, curers, marriage intermediaries, or participating in the civil religious hierarchy common to many parts of Mex Mexico and Mesoamerica, known in the Nahua-speaking region as the cargo system. And what the cargo system really is, is a political and authority structure within communities in which men, usually along with their wives, hold a series of hierarchically arranged positions moving from more lowly positions to positions of much more authority. And men cycle through these, the holders of these positions often change on a yearly basis, and women can accrue some authority in that system depending on who their husbands are. So, Nama women do have arenas in which they can assert authority and power. Their actions in asserting authority and power can be both complementary to, yet they often are still subordinate to the authority and power of men. Primarily because Nama women family, excuse me, because Nawa family and kin kinship configurations tend to undermine female agency more than they promote it. The patrilocal marriage pattern that I already mentioned plays a prominent role in weakening female assertions of will. But there are two other important factors that also undermine women's authority. That is their age at marriage and violence against women. One important factor in understanding women's authority is that women past and present, sometimes marry very young, sometimes as early as in their early teens. And no 13 or 14 year old in any world culture that I'm aware of in 2007, because we're not talking about the Stone Age when people's, people were lucky if they lived to be the age of, of 40, no 13-year-old in any contemporary context that I'm aware of, no 13-year-old woman, girl, whatever term we want to use, has very much authority. And it's not just that they're marrying at age 13, 14, 15, but they're marrying boys or men who are older. They're not marrying 13-year-old boys, because I wouldn't claim that a 13-year-old boy is a great has a great fount of authority either. But that's not who they're marrying. They're marrying boys or men who are either somewhat or sometimes much older. There's an incredible authority balance, uh, imbalance right there. Another important factor in terms of women's authority is that domestic violence occurs. It can be used by men to express dissatisfaction over performance of household tasks. Sometimes it takes place when wives challenge their husband's authority. 
Sometimes domestic violence takes place when wives express jealousy over possible attractions on the part of their husbands to other women. I don't want to assert that no violence takes place between women and men that isn't male on female. In other words, and let me say that in a less convoluted way, when domestic violence takes place, yes, sometimes it can start with women. Sometimes in a context of a violent incident, women can hit or lash out or even injure men if they have a weapon. But the most common, by far most common, scenario for domestic violence is male on female. And given age and physical differences, the consequences of domestic violence for women in indigenous cultures in Mesoamerica and I would argue across Latin America and there are colonial roots for this and colonial roots for patterns of domestic violence in Latin American cultures more broadly because of age and physical differences between men and women the consequences of domestic, women, domestic violence for women are more serious and it is a real problem. One other caveat before I go on, and, and there is a question which I'll, I'll get in a second. I don't want to say or be heard to say that, in, that domestic violence is more prevalent or is worse in native communities than in non-native communities because that's not, a, that's not the case. I also don't want to be heard to say that domestic violence is a worse problem in Latin America than in other parts of the world. I'm asserting none of those things. I am simply talking about the pattern, patterns of domestic violence as they have been observed and written about by ethnographers, by Latin Americans, by insiders sometimes to these communities. And there was a question. <clears throat> I was wondering if Earlier you said um, agent marriage and violence against women undermine the power and authority of women. So when you say violence against women, do you mean specifically In this context, I am specifically talking about domestic violence, though there are other kinds of violence against women as well, which have to do with politics and political situations and political conflicts and I'm hoping that I'm going to have time to com comment a little bit on that broader on that broader context but in general today when I talk about violence against women I'm talking about domestic violence um, nonetheless even with factors that do have a have a negative impact on women's authority not all women do find ways to play political roles and enact agency beyond the household because the political religious system that, of leadership that I mentioned needs female labor to function, women's roles within that, that system, complementary to and necessary for husbands in order for them to carry out their own positions, women's roles influence whether men hold offices and when they do, how they carry out their appointed tasks, Thus, women can influence whether and how successfully men can climb the ladder of positions that make up a hierarchical, a hierarchical leadership system or structure. Nonetheless, in the political system as constructed by the post-revolutionary Mexican state, the constitutional councils of local communities are made up of and headed by women but headed by men. One of the interesting things about councils within indigenous communities is that women in Mexico got the right to vote in 1953. But even today, when we look at elections at the local level, women vote at the local level in peasant communities and indigenous communities, but especially in indigenous communities, women tend to vote at much lower levels in many smaller numbers. And they participate 
in local political meetings at far lower rates. So there are a variety of contradictory practices at work here that we need to try to understand in assessing something about the status of women. Women began to find means to protest some of these exclusionary practices beginning in the 1930s. Women, for example, some Nahua women, for example, began to protest their lack of access to communal lands. These were lands that were being distributed as a result of the Mexican Revolution. These lands are known as ajitos. And women began to protest their lack of access to ajito lands. Women from the 1930s on also began to participate in some meetings, regional or national, meetings among women to discuss issues that were and are of the greatest importance to them, including work conditions, male outmigration, alcoholism, and other health problems suffered by both men and women. Now women have also tried to form co-ops to market their crafts and to use those co-ops as a structure to promote discussion of women's and larger community issues. In one indigenous community in northeastern Mexico, for example, women who got fed up with high rates of male consumption, consumption of alcohol forced the closure of illegal alcohol factories and publicly burned hidden supplies. And a woman who was interviewed uh, about this protest said, quote, a lot of men are not happy with this, with what they did. But, oh well, at least now they spend time with their families. So in the end, things are better. The development of women's co-ops or grassroots movements to promote gender equality has not occurred among Nawas and in Nawa areas to the same extent as it has elsewhere, especially in Maya regions. And it's a really interesting question, which I'll try to get to, about why co-ops have tended to work better in certain areas than in others. For Nawas, it may be that Nawas are, their communities are so dispersed and they are found under such geographically and culturally different conditions and their communities have experienced such intense waves of change that forming communal organizations of any type becomes very difficult. Another important facet of change for Nahua women and women of indigenous women of central Mexico more generally, which I haven't mentioned yet, has to do with the migration of indigenous women themselves to urban areas, especially Mexico City. And a stream of female migration began to become common in the second half of the 20th century. Why did this come about? It came about largely as a result, paradoxically enough, of male outmigration. Men from Nahuatl communities were migrating either shorter distance, over shorter distances or longer distances for shorter amounts of time or longer amounts of time. And as that male outmigration increased, this left an increasing number of women who were single or married who had to fend for themselves and for their children population pressure and shortages of arable or usable land also worsened women's lives and contributed to a kind of feminization of indigenous poverty that resulted in a form of what might be called super exploitation of women who were and are desperate to help themselves and their children and families by, per by performing a variety of kinds of work for extremely low wages. And the search for any kind of work then often drew women into cities, especially Mexico City. If you've been in any of the tourist areas of Mexico City, you may be familiar with what is a virtual army of impoverished, displaced, 
single, married, or widowed indigenous women who are known in Mexico as the Marias. They can be found on many streets, most especially in the tourist areas of Mexico City and other urban areas. Many of them are Nahuas, others are from different central area groups, but they and their children who often accompany, accompany them sell fruits or vegetables, gum, and or crafts such as dolls in or near city markets, historical centers, and other tourist areas. They are not cheerful or folkloric figures. These are women who live in extreme poverty, who live in extreme circumstances, who may themselves suffer from the effects of domestic violence, other kinds of urban violence, the impact of alcoholism or mental illness, either their own or of family members, they live really hard lives. And they live hard lives due to a series of systemic factors that we can understand as historical pressures that have led to women making decisions in which they find themselves in these circumstances. Because Nahua and other Central Mexican indigenous groups are exposed to a very great degree of integration into the market economy of the contemporary nation state of Mexico, and because they are widely dispersed over a large landscape, the material factors that drive economic and cultural change perhaps impede the construction or reconstruction of a pan nawa identity. The construction of a pan Maya identity is something that has happened to a much greater extent than it has in central Mexico. And for Mayas, that's true in both southern Mexico and in Guatemala itself. Thus, material factors that drive economic and cultural change loom very large in understanding how women's lives, work patterns, political participation, and family lives have changed. Thus, Nahuatl women have often experienced a greater degree of exposure to the dominant mestizo society. That tends to lead to language loss, can lead to pretty dramatic and rapid cultural change. And it's also meant that Nawa women, whether they're in their own home communities or elsewhere, have often experienced a lack of access to education. And that lack of access to education has hampered their efforts to better their own and their families' lives. In other parts of Mesoamerica, we find a somewhat different picture. And I will go on and talk now about Zapotec women. Zapotec or Nuzawi groups are found in the southern and eastern part, parts of the modern state of Oaxaca. These groups are well known through the art and writing of a number of Mexican and foreign artists and writers who were very interested in the Zapotecs. And they were particularly interested in Zapotec women, who were often portrayed as having an exotic image. An image that was captured best in a quote from the Mexican artist and writer Miguel Covarrubias, in which he described the Tehuanas or the Zapotec women of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in the following way. Covarrubias wrote that each Tehuana was, quote, a queen a composite image of Egypt, Crete, Indian, and a gypsy camp. Zapotec poets never tire of writing in praise of the flowing lines, the stride, and the carriage of their women. Tehuanas were also the subject of a famous 1973 feminist ethnography 
by an anthropologist named Beverly Chenius. Chenius wrote a book called The Isthmus Zapotecs, colon, Women's Roles in Cultural Context. Sometimes Zapotec women were described, were and are described as matriarchal figures. That is, these were seen as women who really had power, more power than men and power over men. I would say that's a, a tremendous overstatement. A careful reading of the 20th century ethnographic literature shows that while Zapotec women have played an important role in the region's economic system as both local and longer distance merchants, and that's one of the interesting things about them, that they've done a variety of kinds of work, many of which are similar to the kinds of work that I mentioned for Nahua women, but Zapotec women have often specialized in, in trading and working as merchants. They've also played an important role in the political religious hierarchy of that region. But their lives have often been marked by poverty, by domestic violence, by social unrest, and by male dominant ideology and political structures. Formal political roles and offices have tended in this area as well to remain in male hands. Women are also disadvantaged by the young ages at which they marry. And their image of strength and activism often gets used by Zapotec political organizations more as a way of symbolizing Zapotec identity than as an accurate characterization of women's political roles and authority. And I think that's one of the paradoxes of Zapotec culture and why it's important to know about and to compare about, compare to some of the cultures and gender roles, some of the other cultures and gender roles of, of Mesoamerica is that Zapotec women have this exotic image, have often been used as important symbols of the ethnic identity, but that hasn't exactly translated into meaningful power on a daily basis. We come also to the story and the position of Maya women. The Maya as a group are very complex. The Maya are the largest single native group in Mesoamerica. They are probably not the single largest indigenous group in Latin America because it might be that the highland peoples of South America who speak one of two languages, either Quechua or Aymara, it might be that those peoples as a whole who are culturally fairly uniform, are, it might be that, that the highland peoples are larger in number, but except for the highland South American groups, the Maya are the single largest indigenous group, certainly in Mesoamerica, and are and loom large um, in terms of indigenous groups across Latin America more generally. Maya groups are found in Mexico, Guatemala, and Belize. They number in the millions. I've seen estimates that range from about 4 million to about 12 million. There isn't an exact estimate that I could give you that I really have a lot of confidence in. They do, however, number in the millions. They are linguistically and culturally differentiated. That is, within the Maya, there are a variety of linguistic and cultural variations of importance. And anthropologists have, for better or worse, found their ancient and contemporary cultures to be of great interest. No group among Latin American indigenous people has attracted more interest than the Maya, prehistoric, historical, modern, and contemporary. Like with Nahua women, earlier anthropologists 
tended to stress the housebound nature of Maya women's lives, whether they were talking about Maya women in the Yucatan, Maya women in the Chiapas Highlands, or Maya women of Guatemala. But like novel women, they played a variety of economic roles within and beyond the household. Unlike Nahua women, Maya women tended to produce more goods when they were engaging in productive work that had implications beyond the household. They were often producing goods that had market value. They were producing goods that many anthropologists would refer to as crafts. I tend not to like that word, though it has some utility because I think it both romanticizes and belittles um, the making of, for example, textiles and, and doing weaving. These, it isn't just a quaint traditional practice that makes beautiful things that we might like to, to look at. Um, weaving and textiles had real utilitarian meaning. But unlike the Zapotec women that I mentioned, they engaged very little in trade, especially longer distance trade. They might sell in markets, but these would be local markets at best. As elsewhere, the globalization of the economy and the greater tendency of men to migrate has intensified women's labor within and beyond the household. Women began especially in the second half of the 20th century, Maya women began to perform more agricultural labor, produce crafts for local markets, and sell their labor, often working as domestics or agricultural workers. And today, some are also migrating to perform such labor as far as in, uh, to, to parts of the US and even Canada. One of the ways that Maya women sought to increase their economic power was to form cooperatives. And the cooperatives among Maya women haven't been necessarily uniformly successful, but they've been more successful than they were among, than they were or have been among Nahua women. Co-ops help women buy supplies at lower cost, and they help women sell what they produce to a wider market. In terms of family and kinship structures, these are fairly similar to the kinds of structures that I described for the Nawas, so I won't go into that in detail. Again, we have similar patterns of both assertion of authority, yet factors within and beyond the culture that undermine that authority. In Maya culture, age is very important. It's important in Nawa culture, but it's even more important in Maya culture. And deference to authority, older, younger, male, female, those patterns of deference are very important and they don't empower women. Another thing that's important to point out is that Maya women have, in particular, experienced some very extreme kinds of violence. That have really influenced everybody in Maya communities in southern Mexico and in Guatemala. In southern Mexico, we have the emergence of the EZLN, that is the Zapatistas, in the 1990s. And this led to an engagement, often armed and very tense, between the Mexican army and the Zapatistas. And this also led to lots of conflict within Maya communities as some people sided with the PRI, 
others sided with the Zapatistas. Compounding that conflict within indigenous communities in southern Mexico, especially in Chiapas, has been the Protestant Catholic split that Professor Chestnut spoke about. In Chiapas, the conflict between traditionalist Catholics and converts to Protestantism and evangelical religion has been so extreme that it's led to out, outright violence. And women get caught up in these political issues and issues of religious and cultural change, of course. And in the case of political violence, women have felt that violence in terms of rape and other kinds of violence towards women that has accompanied the Mexican, the presence of the, of the Mexican army. And also in this area, because of the political conflict, paramilitary groups have emerged as well, and violence against women has occurred in that context as well. In Guatemala, as I talked about earlier, a couple of weeks ago, Guatemala experienced extreme political violence. And this was really violence between the left and the right, but indigenous communities got caught up in that violence to such an extent that it became a civil war. Because indigenous communities were often assumed to be or suspected of being aligned with leftist groups. And that brought down a lot of intense violence to such an extent that whole communities were wiped out in the most heated period of violence between 1975 and 1985. What is particularly significant in terms of what happened in Guatemala is that what ha the political violence that took place against indigenous communities in Guatemala affected both men, it affected men, women, and children. Many men were targeted and of course many, men, many more men than women were killed. But women experienced the kinds of political violence that I've mentioned, and many women were, were killed as well. But there were two consequences of that period of violence for women that are particularly interesting. One is that women became widowed. Women in indigenous com communities became widowed at far in far greater numbers and at far higher rates than they had earlier. It's important to understand that in many rural parts of Latin America where poverty is often extreme, that the pattern that we are familiar with with women outliving men is reversed. And there, there are a whole variety of reasons for that, that I could that I could go into, some of it has to do with malnutrition. Some of it has to do with the different disease and injury patterns that men and women suffer. Some of it has to do with childbirth and dying in childbirth. Uh, at any rate, my point is that. In many cases, in rural communities in Guatemala, as a result of the political violence, women were widowed in far higher numbers than they had been previously. And there were many communities in which a large number of the adults present in the community were widowed women. 
these were women who had not previously held positions of power. They were extremely poor because in these families, in rural areas, both men and women need to work for families to survive. They were in communities that were traumatized by violence. They themselves were often traumatized by violence because if they hadn't themselves experienced violence, family members often had. And you had whole communities that were becoming, in a sense, communities of traumatized women who were having to survive in the post-Civil War world. In traditional Maya communities that had political and religious structures that were dependent on the presence and activities of men. So all of, all of a sudden you have patriarchal systems that don't have enough patriarchs. And that's a problem, in part as a result of that, but for other reasons as well. And feminism and the spread of feminism is not unrelated to this. You begin to have indigenous women becoming more politically active, in part as a kind of self-help. For themselves and women in their communities and in, in part as a response to changing and globalizing political systems. Rigoberta Menchu was a K'iche Maya woman, is a K'iche Maya woman born in 1959 who in her teens and 20s, began to become a political activist in Guatemala. She is perhaps most famous for writing what became a very controversial but still useful and insightful book called Ira Gaberta Menchu, which is a sort of autobiography, but is also a political history. And as I mentioned earlier, she was the Nobel Peace Prize winner in 1992. She's a controversial figure in Guatemala. Without getting into the internal, a discussion of the internal politics of Guatemala, I will say that she's a controversial figure in non-indigenous circles, a controversial figure in indigenous circles, but today in 2007 she is beginning a campaign for the presidency of Guatemala. Guatemala will have presidential elections next fall. And it will of course be interesting to see how that plays out, her campaign and those elections. I'm not going to have time to talk about all the different groups that I had hoped to. I think it is important to, to talk about women of different areas and, and indigenous women of Mesoamerica by no means are representative of all indigenous women of Latin America because the geographic, cultural, and, and national histories of each of the areas I mentioned earlier are different. What I do want to talk about is to talk about some of the conclusions that can be drawn about indigenous women generally and then I want to talk a little bit about some of the, some of the issues involved in trying to study the history of women who may not themselves be literate because that raises certain kinds of issues. And then I want to talk a little bit about what the future might bring for Native women. In terms of understanding the history of indigenous women in Latin America, in Latin America more generally, first I would say that for every area that I have talked about or that I could talk about, Native women have a long history of performing productive labor, 
though how we might define productive labor varies. They have a long history of performing productive labor and as I er argued in a previous class, the amount of labor they perform, the amount of work they do, has increased over time. Again, I'm not saying that they work more than men. I'm saying that if we look at their patterns of labor over time, their amount of work has increased and intensified. Also, I think we can conclude that while the degree to which women are politically active varies, in many parts of Latin America, in both the past and present, women have played roles in community, political, and religious structures of authority, and they've played roles in agitating for change. Another co conclusion that can be drawn is that while families, households, and kin structures have often offered women sanctuary and support, both emotional and material, Male, female, as well as parent-child relations can be marked by tension, even violence. And what's important about that point is that family and household can be a shelter in the storm, but it can also be the source of the storm. And that makes dealing with the problem of domestic violence. That's one of the reasons that dealing with the problem of domestic violence is very difficult. Finally, I want to say, and I think this can be concluded to some extent from the points I've been making about the specific ethnic groups and women's roles within those groups that I've talked about, but this also speaks to the patterns of change that I'll mention briefly. Globalization is important in understanding what's happening with women and men in indigenous communities in Latin America. And I think for women, globalization has had a contradictory impact. On the one hand, globalization simply speeds up change. It enmeshes indigenous communities and families ever more deeply in market forms of production and exchange. It intensifies the exploitation of female labor. And it undermines complementarity in male-female relations. At the same time, globalization brings with it new forms of political organization as well as access to international aid and worldwide media. The Zapatistas, one of the, the incredible factors that led to the Zapatistas becoming so well known was their very skillful use of the media. And globalization and the existence of a globalized media makes that possible. Zapatista women played an important role in that because Zapatista women understood that they could mobilize support from women's groups outside of their own area in Mexico and from outside of Mexico. And they did it, again, very skillfully. And when I say very skillfully, I am not being cynical. I'm saying that they had a capacity, they had an understanding that that was a useful strategy and they had a capacity to put that strategy into action. And when I talked about Nahua women not being as organized, that in part is what I'm referring to. You may well know about some of the struggles or issues affecting Zapatista women. You probably don't know too much about the struggles and issues affecting Nahua women because you, by and large, probably haven't heard about them. And there are are reasons for that, and globalization, I think, is good and bad, plays an important role in that. Globalization, especially globalization of the means of communication, means that to a greater extent than ever before, Native women can help shape their own images, and they can give voice 
to their ideas, hopes, and agendas for change. And they can do that in a variety of contexts, local, national, and international. These trends began in the 1990s, and they will only accelerate in this century. And these trends will have a deep impact on Native women and gender roles within and beyond Native communities. For Native women, there is and will be in the future, I would predict, a growing tendency towards activism. Secondly, there is an increase in the numbers of and roles for female indigenous leaders. And third, women have had and will have an increasing ability to make their voices heard and to play a greater role in shaping their own images. Rigoberta Menchu was crucial in helping that change to come about. While she dictated her memoir, which was, as I said, both an autobiography as well as a history of her, her community and a history of her, her region in Guatemala, she may have dictated that her memories to somebody else who wrote them down, even though she was herself she was herself literate. But in doing so, she made her own voice heard and laid the basis for her own role in some of the changes that are taking place in Guatemalan politics. Tracing out these changes is not an easy thing to do because the kinds of sources that historians typically would use are not always useful when doing women's history, especially when doing indigenous women's history, where many women are not themselves, and certainly in the past were not themselves literate. So it becomes a struggle to find their voices. Ethnographies are one of the sources that allow us to trace some of this history as, as I've tried to do here today. If globalization has worsened gender inequalities for indigenous women and for women in many parts of the world, the scope and scale of Latin American indigenous women's activities and assertions of agency in the current period is also unprecedented. And as these and other women demand representation, rights, and education, they'll gain an ever greater capacity to organize, and they'll play an ever greater role in the politics of their own communities and their nation states. And I'll stop there for now. Thank you.